Hello everybody, you find me behind the wheel of yet another second generation Jaguar XK, a model that I've always had a bit of a fondness for and I've been lucky enough to feature many times on the channel, with everything up to and including the fire-breathing limited edition XK RS GT. But one of the very few that I haven't ever talked to you about is this, the first of them all, the naturally aspirated 4.2 litre V8 as seen when the car was launched in 2006. And I am absolutely delighted to finally be able to make this video because I firmly believe not only is this the cheapest of the second generation XKs, I think it might also be one of the best and more than that could be the most sensible yet still special car you can buy for less than £10,000. And why is that? Well, stay tuned to find out in today's episode of JM on Cars. video I need to say an extra big thank you to this car's owner Giles because this is actually the second time that he's brought it to me. I often say to people that there are some cars that for whatever reason just don't want to be filmed. Sometimes it's a model and sometimes a specific example and I've been trying to get this exact car on camera for ages now. And some of you, I'm sure, will already have recognised this car because it first belonged in the land of YouTube to my friend Jack from the channel number 27, who bought it last year, enjoyed it for a little while, and then sold it to my also friend Ben from the channel Dad Cars, who used it for a raffle prize, and it was then won by Giles, who was also a fan of the channel and kindly agreed to bring it to me. And not only has he finally given me the opportunity to drive the car, but when we filmed it first, there was a bit of an issue with my sound. And though I could have made a video out of it, I didn't really want to. So he very, very kindly agreed to bring the car back to me yet again and to now make this piece. So Giles, you legend. Alright then, let's talk about the car, and though I'm fairly sure most of you are familiar with the Jag XK, let's give you a quick recap. There are two modern iterations of the car Jaguar made bearing the XK name. The first came out in the mid-1990s and lasted until around 2004-2005. That's what's known as the X100 generation. This is the second, known as the X150. And although they were separated in the showrooms by a mere matter of months, in truth, the cars feel like they are a decade apart. And that is for very good reason, because the original, the X100, was actually built on a platform that dated back to the 1970s, having started life as the Jaguar XJS. But before it became the XK, the platform was actually reworked into the Aston Martin DB7. Today, really, both the XK and DB7 should be viewed as classics. They are expensive to run, they are both quite cramped inside, they have many a compromise about them, and realistically, if you're looking to pick one of those up and expecting anything other than a project, well, brace yourself. This, though, is about as different as it was possible for a car to get. It was as new as the previous one was old, now being based on an all-new bonded and riveted aluminium chassis shared with the then-also-new XJ. This was a big deal. Even today, to see a car made on an all-aluminium platform is a rarity. Back then, it was a statement. The only real carryover from the old car was the engine, which is absolutely fine because it's magnificent. A 4.2-litre all-aluminium 48-valve V8, which was available in just one of two flavours, either naturally aspirated, as we have it here, making 300 horsepower and 310 pound-foot of torque, that's 420 newton metres, or with a supercharger bolted to it, making initially 420 horses. At no point in the entirety of this car's life was it fitted with anything other than a V8. Mm. The gearbox was a six-speed ZF automatic and, like its predecessor, at no point was this car ever offered with a manual. There are a great many reasons as to why that was, but one common suggestion is that it would have made the car a little too close to Aston Martin's offerings of the day. 
Personally, I don't believe that because Jaguar did still put manuals in some of their other cars. I think they just did their homework and realized no Jaguar buyer really wanted one and to have gone to all the effort of engineering it in would have simply been wasted time. The fact is that even at near 20 years old, this six-speed box is really rather lovely. There are other fundamental things absolutely right about this car. Bolted to that chassis on each corner, you'll also find a double wishbone suspension. Though it is also now getting on a little bit, I think it's still a very pleasing thing to the eye. It is a lovely car. It exudes elegance. It isn't shouty, it isn't raucous, and to be honest, some of the later XKs, things like the RS in particular, I felt just went a little bit too far. There is something, I think, about a Jaguar that should always hold a little back in the styling department. The car was facelifted in 2009, with the exterior receiving some subtle alterations that, to my eye, do bring it a little more up to date. The interior was also revised, and the biggest, most obvious difference being the replacement of the old school Jaguar J Gate selector down here with the more modern pop up rotary, that, in all fairness, does have its own issues but I much prefer looking at. The engine was also upgraded, changed to the third generation of Jaguar's AJ V8 unit, now displacing five liters, which in regular guys without the supercharger gave you 385 horses, and with the supercharger, first off 500, then at the end 550 for the likes of the RS. They are lunatic machines. The car eventually went out of production officially in 2014, though truth be told, it was wound down slowly over a period of a couple of years, as it was on sale for a little while alongside its effective successor, the F-Type, which is actually built on essentially a cut-down version of this same platform. The compromise being that car lost the back seats, which to some will be a non-issue like for myself, but to others a deal breaker. And though I do frequently mock them, the fact is those seats are probably just about as useful as you'd find in a 911 or a DB9. The car was available either as a coupe, as we have here, or a convertible. And I drove a 4.2 litre naturally aspirated convertible a few years ago. It was a lovely and very pleasant thing. But for me, a Jag really wants to be a coupe, particularly something like this. That's the look of the thing. That is the profile. That's what makes it so alluring. And though I get the drop top, for me, nah, it has to come with a roof. These also happen to be pretty much the cheapest of all XKs, with the convertible sometimes commanding a small premium, but often not that much. Naturally, there is a small compromise with the convertible having a slightly reduced boot, but to be fair, in this, it's already pretty generous, and for most people I would wager the convertible is fine, with this being more than adequate. Again, it's certainly better than, say, your equivalent Aston Martin. A car with which I know a lot of people will draw comparisons, particularly as they're both products of the Ford Empire, and share these switches down here for the window that come off a Volvo, however, to drive, to sit in, they're a fairly different proposition. First off, this Jag, you can see a bit more of the bonnet, which I like. The whole thing also feels a little more comfortably set up. The vast majority of XKs and all XKRs are fitted with something Jaguar called CATS. Computer advanced technology suspension or something daft. Anyway, that's adaptive dampers. This car has it, you can tell because there's a wire coming out of the top of the strut, and it is a system that you cannot control but actually does a fairly good job. In fact, I would go as far as to say these cars feel a little better damped than the XJ of the time, which rode on air suspension with this having more traditional coils and springs. One thing I've always found really fascinating about Jaguars is when you're trying to talk to people and offer suggestions as to what car they should buy, you mention a Jag, and they'll generally say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm far, far too young for that. They see them all as very pipe and slippers cars, and I don't get that. And that's for two reasons, really. First off, for a very, very long time, a Jaguar was the car of choice for your ne'er-do-well. It was the go-to car for your getaway driver. I would say no other brand was more heavily associated with the criminal underworld than Jag. 
they did a fantastic ad campaign playing off that very reputation. You might remember it had Tom Hiddleston, Mark Strong, and um, someone else whose name I forget, but uh, you remember, bad guys are English and they drive a Jag. Fantastic marketing. And the other is because even this, the most lowliest and humble of the XKs, with its just 300 horsepower, well, if you put it over into sport mode and change down with the paddles behind the wheel, it'll do this. And here's the thing, when you're on Auto Trader late at night, you're working out what car you'd put in your dream garage, it's really, really easy to get a bit of budget creep. And this is one of the classic examples of that because it's a car where you start off looking at something like this and you go, oh blimey, you can have one of those for just six and a half grand. And then you go, ah oh, yeah, but uh, I don't really want the naturally aspirated one, I want the supercharged, I want the XKR, and, and then you start going, well, you know, if I'm going to spend that much, I might as well spend a little bit more and get a facelift one, and then before you know it, your six and a half grand car has morphed into a 45 grand XKRS, and you decide you're just going to go and buy a 911 anyway. And that's a shame because this really has just about everything you'd want from a Jag, which is grace, pace, and space. It's got the grace. It's a good looking car. Outside, yeah, it's getting on a little bit now, but it's decent. Inside, it's the same story. This is a base model. Doesn't have quite as much leather and the like as some others. The infotainment down here is old. It is a little bit cranky and it is frankly a touch frustrating but you know what it's not a big problem and should you want you can also upgrade it and put in android auto with a system called jagdroid the seats are really comfy there's plenty of adjustment in it and this is absolutely a car that would eat the miles on a motorway should you want it to space you've got that covered yeah sure back seats not great but boot perfect and what about pace well yes i know 300 horsepower barely cuts it in the world of the hot hatch but this is an older car and there is so much to be said for the way a big meaty multi-cylindered naturally aspirated engine delivers its power Just recently, I got to drive the Jaguar F-Type with its 2.0-litre four-cylinder turbo, and that makes 300 horsepower. But it feels like a very different 300 horsepower to what you get here. They feel like bigger horses, angrier horses, some of them possibly with tattoos. Though it doesn't have the low-down savagery and mid-range of the supercharged version or an Aston Martin's V12, this engine is still more than capable. It has a beautiful spread of torque from essentially just above idle all the way to its just under 7,000 RPM red line. A gorgeous soundtrack too. The brakes are also pretty decent, very nice and easy to modulate. And if I were to level one criticism at this car, it would be that the throttle pedal is set up in such a way that when you're pulling away at a junction, it can lurch a little bit. The car is actually over eager on occasion, particularly for those that don't maybe have too much experience of this kind of car. The lower powered variants also mean that when the road conditions aren't great, you can put your foot down a little easier and with a little more confidence. The steering is lovely. Yes, it's on the light side, but then it's a Jaguar GT car. I would expect it to be. The Aston Martins of the day, even including stuff like the DB9, were always set up a little more sharply, a little more sportily. And in some cases, that meant they were cars that wound up with a little bit of an identity crisis going on. This, though, always knew what it wanted to be. It is a gentleman's express. And that really has always been a large part of the appeal. This is a car that I think would work brilliantly, either as a daily driver, because you can simply hop into it and go, even if you've not got experience of a car like this. It's very easy, visibility is very good in all directions. The car is friendly, the gearbox is nice, and then as you build confidence in the car, you can eventually start to press on and unlock some of its talents. The automatic gearbox, it's nice, it's smooth, it's refined when you've got it in drive and you're around town, and then when you want to have fun, no, oh, of course, it's not as sharp as a dual clutch or even the later ZF8 speed that the F-Type got. 
but it's better than you'd expect it to be given the age of the car. I can place it with relative ease. It doesn't feel like I'm taking up too much of the road. Everything about this is just right. I think I could build a far bigger list of gripes with my DB9. That is a car that is in so many ways a lot better. But then when new, it cost a lot more. However, you can also feel there are areas where that was a more bespoke, more hand-built, low-volume car. This is a little more mass-produced, and that's not always a bad thing. And it is for that reason that if you do want to own it as something a little bit special, which is how Giles is treating it, I think it's got just enough to really warrant that. You've got that lovely engine. This one is entirely standard and it still makes a damn good noise. It's available in a variety of different colours, trims, and I'd really prefer one with a, a lighter interior. They do just feel a little more special. However, every single one of them does feel like an event. You're never going to mistake this for your Commodore, Garden Variety, BMW, Porsche, or that sort of thing. They're really rather wondrous. Your 911 owner is simply never, ever going to get it. And the fact is, yes, their car is faster. Yes, their car is better around a track. But the jag is for the man or woman that does not care. And the truth is that in the real world, where you're likely to spend most of your time, this is the better car. Should you want to know more about this car and the many different versions that existed, some of the things that can go wrong with them, I'd suggest you check out the buyer's guide that I did a little while back. But the short version is that these are a really very pleasant thing to own. They're decent on fuel and can average high 20s, potentially even into the 30s if you're that way inclined. But regardless, for not just a V8 but a sports car, they're actually pretty good. Tax, of course, is not likely to be great, but insurance, I expect, will generally be better than the equivalent 911 and certainly M3. They also have a reputation for being one of Jaguar's best-built models, and though I know to some that may be a backhanded compliment, the truth is these should be fairly low-maintenance cars. And I might actually go so far as to say, if you are comparing it with, let's say, an E46 M3 or a 996 Generation 911, this should actually be easier and probably cheaper to look after. And where in recent years both of those models have seen a fair amount of appreciation, the Jaguar is still somewhat undervalued, with examples of the 4.2 litre such as this starting at just £6,500. I can tell you from experience that a number of the cars at that price won't be particularly good. I know for a fact this wasn't the first one that Jack went and looked at, he inspected another and it just wasn't a good car but it is proof that they do exist. Spend a little bit more and you will get yourself into a nicer example, and I personally would always be tempted by the R, but this proves you really don't need it, and if budget is a concern, I would say it is definitely better to spend a little extra and get a really good example of the XK and not a bad example of an R. So there we have it. That is the second generation Jaguar XK. An exceptional car at a rather tempting price. I'd have one. Would you? Anyway, as ever, I want to say a huge thank you to Giles for bringing his car out twice and to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.